Hi, I'm Gabriel Halpern. Welcome to Over the Hill Yoga. A wonderful opportunity to be together with you. So today I'm going to teach a class that is influenced heavily by the Iyengar tradition, where alignment is a kind of enlightenment. So I hope that the details that you hear uh, clarify for you a intelligent way of using the poses so that they're both safe and effective and aesthetic. So we're going to start off with some hip openers and groin openers and hamstring stretches and then we're going to show you how to do standing poses so that you can have stability and resilience as well as strength and flexibility and then we'll end it off with an inversion pose that will teach you how to bring some extra blood into your brain so that one of the teaching modules I'd like you to get from this experience is that we flex the spine, we extend the spine, we rotate the spine, and we invert the spine so blood comes into the head. So enjoy. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to serve. So we're going to start off the class first by giving you a hand position called a mudra to channel your energy. Touch your thumb to your middle and ring finger and extend the index and the pinky finger. Out there. So then you can relax your hands here and make sure that you're not lurching forward with your head. Bring your head back in space so the back body is like a blackboard. So the back of your skull, your shoulder blades, the back of your waistline are all on one line. So get centered, which means leave your worldly life and your identity with the social role you play or however you perceive yourself with your shoes because the teacher that guarantees the least disappoints the least. And the only guarantee I make is at the end of the class, whatever problems you had, they'll still be there. So this is the time to really give yourself respite and temporarily disidentify with your normal biography and what's on your plate, what you have to face. Because yoga teaches you both how to engage in life and also how to disengage appropriately. So. Close your eyes for a second and tune in to what I call body, breath, brain, and mind. So body means just notice what your anatomy is telling you, how this pose feels. And then how are you breathing? In every pose that we'll do, there's a different kind of respiratory rhythm. So notice, even if it's very gentle and minor, what kind of breathing is happening. And then distinguish your brain from your mind as the sensory input. The brain is the part of you that's registering like a radar device. Every sound, sight, touch, taste, and smell. But your mind is the part that's assigning a value to it, labeling it, giving a concept to the pure percept. So with that in mind, just for a minute, notice body, breath, brain, and mind in silence. Now bring your palms together and center your chest into Namaste. I'm going to chant the mantra Om three times. You can join me if you'd like. If not, I will set the vibration. And this is a universal mantra to invite the forces of higher consciousness to take over, leave our egos aside, and become channels through which spirit can flow. Om. Bow your head and salute the essence of yoga within yourself. 
Keeping the eyes closed, bring your head back upon your spine. Bring your hands back onto the top of your thighs, touching your thumb to your middle and ring finger. And gently open your eyes. All right. I'm mighty glad to be alive today, and I hope that you are too. Thank you for joining me. And uh, this hand position is sometimes called Appan Mudra. It's one that deals with releasing energy, shedding energy, getting rid of energy, letting go, which is a big word that people use all the time uh, to understand the difference between the yoga mindset and the kind of mindset that we walk around with in our daily life. And integrating the two, of course, is part of what yoga is, because yoga means union, the joining together of disparate aspects, whether it's body and mind, self and other, culture and nature. So, one little ground rule before we begin today, and that is, the essence of what I'm sharing is hit the mat. I can't make it any clearer than that. It's a fantastic subject to discuss. The philosophy is vast. It's esoteric. You can't get it at one glimpse. But where the rubber meets the road is, hit the mat. You can only understand it through experience. And although I love metaphysical speculation, but understand it's speculation. When you get to the third and fourth chapter in the Yoga Sutras, let's be honest, nobody knows anyone with occult powers. Nobody knows the different depths of the samadhi states that they're talking about. We're all in the shallows. Or as I like to say, if my teacher was here, he would unabashedly look at everyone and say, see this man? He has not gone too far. And I would be perfectly okay with that because I'm teaching a subject, the further reaches of which I haven't experienced myself. But since I have to be honest, I've never met any yoga teacher, all of my teachers who've, who've demonstrated the occult powers as demonstrated in chapter 3 of the Yoga Sutras, nor have they been bold enough to say, I've experienced that level of samadhi, because the moment they would say that, I would kind of question it. It's like having the Buddha say, don't you see I'm the enlightened one? Yeah, that's a pretty enlightened thing to say. So... We're all just working the first and second chapter, defining what yoga is, and then doing the techniques to experience it. So the greatest gift that yoga can give you is getting on fire for hitting the mat, doing it daily. And so you don't think I'm just a, like a yoga Nazi. It isn't just yoga I'm talking about. It's whatever is your passion. That's your yoga. What connects you? What gives you a glimpse into sacred space? What does sacred mean? Something where you get out of time. You're no longer remembering the past. You're no longer thinking about the future. You're completely immersed in being alive in reality, in the present moment, right now. Beyond that, I can't take you. So I invite you all to enjoy me as we go and do this yoga session. So now, let's begin. We want to show our model, Colleen, because one of the teaching devices I've picked up from my instructors, Mr. Iyengar, his daughter and son, Gita and Prashant, was first, show the pose in silence. That's called demonstrate. Then, listen to the instruction, so that first, the people who are visually oriented can learn by a picture's worth a thousand words. This is what it looks like. But then there's some students, they understand better if they hear the instructions. So if they're auditorily intelligent, we're going to say it clearly, so there'll be no doubt in your mind what we're asking you to do. And then we'll observe what you're doing, and then we'll make corrections. Because what's the sense of having a teacher if they don't tell you how to improve your pose, right? Yeah. So we're going to do that. Colleen will be our, our model, and then we'll take you through it, and let's begin. So now we're going to turn around, and we're going to face the camera, and Colleen's going to demonstrate for us. Let's start on the floor first. We're going to start on the floor, and we're going to do three poses, which are hip-opening poses. The first one is Dandasan, so you guys can watch first, and then the second time through, we'll take you through it. So in Dandasan, you sit on the floor. Sometimes we call Dandasan, the staff pose, the floor version of Tadasan. It's as if the upper body, from the waistline to the crown, is doing vertical Tadasan, and the lower body, the hips to the heels, are doing horizontal Tadasan. So that implies that you understand what Tadasan is. So this is the first one. Then she'll bend her legs at the knees and bring her heels in toward herself, and open 
the knees to the outside and with her hands draw her feet closer into her body. Uh -huh. And then she'll stretch her legs out into Upavishta Konasana, wide leg stretch, and use her hands behind first to lift up. And then the second action will be stretch the arms up like Urdhva Hastasana, and then exhale, reach forward, grab the big toes if you can, and pull back and lift up. And get a little action like that. So if we did those three together in a kind of mini vinyasa, flowing from one to the other, the first one would be Dandasana. The second one would be Bhattakonasana, bound angle pose. And the third one would be Upavishtakonasana, wide angle pose, grabbing the feet and pulling back. Then we'll reverse the order. We'll go from Bhattakonasana back to Dandasana, back to Upavishtakonasana, like that. So we'll do that one or two times, and then we'll give you some variations on corrections. Got it? All right, so let's everybody do that together. Let's start off in Dandasana. And you're pressing your hands down on the floor and lifting your chest up. Shoulders are rolling back and down. All right. Now, spread your toes. Activate your toes. So make sure that your chin is up. All right. That's good. And join the inner legs together as much as you can. So you'll see this in, in, in uh, Tadasana as well. Squeeze your ankles in. Yes. Squeeze your knees in. Squeeze your hips together. Feel how that activates the legs. And press the back of the leg down from the buttock bone through the heel. Very good. So there's your, your basic um, Dandasana action. Now pull the toes toward your face, but the heels stretch away from your face. That's right. Very good. So now, second action. Inhale, exhale, bend your legs at the knees and bring the heels close to you like Bhattakonasana. Use your hands to draw them further in. Now, for the students whose knees are higher up than your hips, Here's one thing that will help you. If you lean behind on your hands, lean behind on your hands, and see how the knees opened up a little bit? Yes, because you just dropped the weight off of the pelvis by leaning the spine back. Much, much better. You get that? Yeah. So now, pull the legs in a little closer with your hands. Go ahead. Or move your buttock forward to your heels. Either way. That's better. Join the feet together again. That's right. Okay, good. And then hands behind and lean back again and open up the knees. Good, and now, of course, breathe. Don't forget to breathe. So take a little inhale and exhale here. Very good. Upavishta Konasana, widen your legs to the outside, flex the toe, extend the heel. So this is like a wide version of Dandasana. So whatever you learned about Dandasana, all right, there you go. So stretch the hands up in the air first, Urdhva Hastasana, lengthen the spine, and then exhale, reach and grab the big toe between the big toe and index toe if you can, and then pull back and lift up. All right, so if you're having difficulty here, right, one way would do it, give John the belt around his feet. So this is not necessary. You can do it without the belt. Like John was grabbing his calves, that was fine. But you just put it around the ball mounts of your feet and then hold it. No, you don't have to loop it. Okay. So hold that with the right hand, John, and then other one with the left hand. No, separate that. Walk your hands as close to the feet as possible, but pull back and lift your chest. You got it. That's right. And activate your legs. Yes. Now look at the foot. Look at your foot. Are you tilting your foot closer to the pinky toe side or the big toe side? Keep them even. Yes. And press the back of the leg to the floor. Yes. Chest up, shoulders down. Very nice. Take three long, slow, deep breaths as a group. Inhale and exhale. Nice. Don't be in any rush. You're doing fine. Keep spreading those toes. Inhale and exhale. Good. Pull your low back in and up. There you go. Inhale and exhale. Okay, let go of the belt. And now let's do this to, just to lubricate the body. So put the belt to the side. Bring the legs together in Dandasana and help them. And now we're just going to do this three times in a row, both sides. All right, so bend the legs at the knees, Bhattakonasana, and bring them in. Inhale and exhale. Open the legs wide, Upavishtakonasana. Inhale and exhale. Just go for the foot. Good. Then stretch Dandasana back together. Inhale and exhale, and again, Baddha Konasana. Bend the legs, bring them in, inhale and exhale. That's right. Upavishta Konasana, wide leg stretch. That's the second time. Right. Last time, Dandasana in the center. Take a breath. Baddha Konasana is the next one. Take a breath. Upavishta Konasana is the third one. Right. So now we're going to reverse. Baddha Konasana, bring it in. Breathe. 
Don Dawson, stretch them forward. You got it. Upavishta Kanasan, widen. Nice. Chest up. Good. And again, Badakanasan. Dandasan. Upavishta Kanasan. Get the idea? So moving fast through the pose sometimes just helps you to lubricate the body a little bit. One more time. Badakanasan. Dandasan. Upavishta Kanasan. And then back to Dandasan. All right, good work. Thank you so much. All right, so now let's move on to weight-bearing pose, Adho Mukha Svanasana. Like we say in our technique, another day, another dog. It's one of the best poses to do because it covers so many different things in the body. And one of the other teachings I try to get across is in every class, regardless of its focus, I want to make sure that the spine flexes or moves forward, the spine extends and moves back, the spine rotates from one side to the other, and the spine inverts, which means we put it in a position with respect to gravity where blood is coming toward the head, lower than the heart, and the legs higher than the head. So dog pose is a flexion of the spine already, and the head is lower than the heart, so it's a partial inversion. So the first variation we're going to do is for people who have tight calf muscles, and how do you know that the heel doesn't get to the floor? So do dog pose, open up your palms, exhale your breath, and stretch together. Good. You can have your feet hips width apart, that's okay. So take your legs a little further back. There you go, good. So let your head go completely. There you go. And stretch the finger webbings to the max. Absolutely increase the distance between every digit as best as you can. All right, now, make the top of the thigh the highest point in the pose, not the buttock, the top of the thigh the highest point in the pose. There you go. All right, now watching your own legs to see what you're doing. You saw Colleen's demonstration. Take your right foot and hook it at the big toe and index toe behind the left Achilles heel and press it down. Exactly. Just like that. Now, with the aid of that leg, stretch your left leg further back. Even if it's a, an incremental movement. Any movement is an achievement. And then don't hold your breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Yes. Very good. All right, switch legs. Put the right hand down. Take a breath first. Get centered. Keep moving your chest toward your thighs. That's it. Head down, John. Now, left foot, big toe, index Get by the right Achilles, that's it, press it down, much better. And even though you're pressing the heel down, stretch the toes forward. Ah, now I just saw the toes activate, exactly, just like that. So now, understood how to do it? All right, now put the left foot down, and now stretch both legs and get that heel down. As the heel moves back away from your toes, stretch your toes forward. Broaden your toes, latitudinally and longitudinally. There you go, now they're active. Okay, good. Inhale, exhale, come down from step for a second. Relax. Good. Second time through. Inhale, exhale, go back to your dog pose. So, for those of you who are practicing at home, you might have a, a friend who might help you like this. They're going to come behind you and watch what I'm doing. I'm putting my feet next to Betty's feet, and first I'm going to say to Betty, push your feet against mine for you. Oh, see, she just activated. So then I'm going to take the top of her thigh and move it straight back. And then she's going to walk her arms a little further forward, right? But don't let your legs come forward when your arms go forward. Push against me. Don't lose it. There you go. And keep breathing like that. All right? We're going to try this with John. Now, shorten your stance just a little bit, John, to get your heels down more. There you go. And get them in the same plane. Very good. And then I'm going to say, resist your heels against me. Push out against me. There you go. See? Keep that action. Widening your legs and move this back gently. Very good. You got it. Keep activating your legs. Yes. And breathe. Good work. Down you go. All right, so that's a nice little dog pose variation to stretch the Achilles heel and teach you how to move your thighs back. Very good. Now, come on and watch this next demonstration. Um, I don't think this is too esoteric, but we'll say it out there. In the technique that I work with, there are different categories of poses, all, all Hatha Yoga teaches, right? Standing poses, twisting poses, forward bends, back bends, inversions, arm balances, restorative poses, and so forth. And each category of pose has a prototype that if you understand that pose, you understand all the poses in that system, even though all the poses are different. The whole system is based on Tadasana. To the extent that you understand how to stand erect, 
you understand everything you're trying to learn in yoga. But from the yoga's point of view, it was being able to lift your pelvis so that you could no longer be scraping your knuckles on the floor. That's what caused the brain explosion, if you look evolutionarily. Tadasan, that we could do tadasan. So here's what I want you to realize. Most people don't understand the back body. They're lurching forward, especially adults. We do everything in flexion positions, driving our car, cell phone, computers. And of course, if you ever see kids hate to do forward bends. They love back bends. Older people hate to do back bends. And of course, that's really what you want to do. You want to open up the front of the body tremendously. So let's look at what Colleen is doing here. First, she's using an outer edge. We have a pillar here in the studio, but you could do the jaw jam would be the same thing. And notice that she's touching her heels, her tailbone, the space between the shoulder blades, and the back of her skull especially. That's creating that line on the back body. Now, if she uses that as a guideline and then just takes a step forward but maintains that awareness, now she understands she's just doubled her consciousness by bringing awareness to the back of her body. Now, you know you don't stand this way because the fact that it's an asana, which classically means seat, but it also means an assumed position. You have to put this on, right, because you don't stand this way. Now, drop down, show everybody how you really stand. Oh, my God, look at that. That's what we want you to get. What does it really mean to stand up correctly? All right, so everybody, come on up and find an outer pillar. So st start with your heels forward, away from the outer edge, and start with the tailbone touching, the space between the shoulder blades touching, and the back of your skull touching. Ah, Now, don't change that, but now move the feet together and the heels touching that bottom outer edge as well. Yeah. So that's just a little helpful hint. If a person has a bad back, they can do the upper body first and then move the feet in second, right? Now have the sides of your hands, the palms facing the sides of your hips and stretching down. Your bicep stretches down through your thumb and the tricep stretches down through the pinky. Maintain that. Now, take a little inner selfie. What does it feel like? All right, in a moment, I'm going to say step away from the pillar, but keep the back body awareness that you have right now. All right, inhale, exhale, step forward away from the pillar and maintain the back body awareness. All right, now you know you've assumed this posture. You don't stand this way normally. All right, so now get ready to, uh, as the old poker phrase says, uh, read them and weep. All right, drop down to how you normally stand. Right there, take another, take another selfie right there. That's the collapsed state that we're trying to bring more awareness to so that more of our life is done consciously. Now, not using the pillar, stretch back to what you just learned. Put it on. Demonstrate your awareness. Exactly. Just like that. All right. Thank you very much. So remember that. Come back to your mat and have a block with you. So Colleen is going to show you first what we mean by activating your legs. She's going to stand in Tadasan first. Now, if you bring your feet together, the base is a little narrower, which is okay, but if you find that, that you're wobbling a little by having the feet so close together, bring the feet apart, it's not a problem. All right, now here's the idea. Even if you think like you're doing the back body alignment, right, something is not being activated. And so in a strange way, good teaching sometimes shows you where you're not, as opposed to only showing you positively where you are. Right? So never be insulted by having pointed out where you need to go to improve the pose. So she's going to take a block now, and she's going to put it on its side edge between the feet. Right? And first, you could say that doing the block in this way just teaches you how to have parallel feet. Okay? But now, watch what happens to her legs. If I said, now, squeeze the block. Uh-oh, something just activated that wasn't happening before. Right? Where she lets it go, see there's a collapse both downward and outward. So you're always trying to compact the body toward the midline. So now I said, squeeze again. You can see what just happened, right? And then we want to elongate the trunk so she'll spin her arms to the outside, do Urdhva Hastasana, and elongate her rib cage way up off of the waistline while still activating the block. See? Because you can forget so easily. All right? And exhale, down you go. Let's give that a shot, all right? So stand in Tadasana, put the block between your feet, have the block on its side edge, 
Second edge, good, step into it. So first, by doing that, you have the parallel feet. That's correct. Now, add what you learned from having the pillar behind you, get that chin up, right? Hands by the sides of your hips, thumbs stretching downward from the bicep, pinky stretching downward from the tricep, there you go, much better. Now, even though your feet are parallel, you're not activating yet. So now squeeze the block for a second. Oh, something just happened, didn't it? Okay. So just be clear, don't squeeze the block. You see the just collapse that just happened? So now you're, you're responsible. Now you know. Before you didn't know, now you know. Squeeze the block again. Notice what happened. All right, so there's your Tadasana action, really activating. Notice how it pulls you up and channels everything in. Now, spin the palms to the outside, Inhale, exhale, raise your arms up onto Urdhva Hastasan and get them as vertically as you possibly can. Right. So we're going to have uh, uh, Urdhva Hastasan means the palms are parallel as opposed to touching the palms together like Namaste. Right. Stretch the thumbs away from the rest of the fingers. Very good. And parallel palms. Keep dropping the shoulders off your ears. Right. Chin is level, my friend. If you can gently bring your hands back behind the ear holes, you can see how tight the shoulders are. Keep the fingers together and the thumbs stretched away. Very good. And breathe. Keep the navel toward the back body. Good. And stretch those elbows up. And push up into my fingers. That's right. Notice which arm is straight or which arm is bent. Hmm? Which arm is closer to your head, which arm is further away from the head. And of course, breathe. Did you forget to squeeze the block? Let me see that again. That's right. All right. Exhale, namaste, and down you go. So that's just a little quick lesson for Tadasana. Very nice. Now we want to teach you something about balance. Really important for all of us to maintain balance. And balance can be thought of in a lot of different ways. I'm not just talking about standing on one leg. Of course, that's what we're going to do. I'm talking about how polarities are in our life. And we're always veering back and forth between extremes. How do we find more what the middle way is, the golden mean? That's another aspect of balance, right? So what we're going to do first is show you what I call hierarchy of purpose. Why are you practicing the pose? Have you never thought about the reasons behind why you're practicing the pose? Some people practice for flexibility. Some people practice for focusing on their mind. Some people practice for breath control. A lot of different reasons. So in the hierarchy of poses, free balancing for some people is really an important thing. So what I mean by free balancing is if you watch, uh, we can watch her standing leg ankle. We're doing vrikshasan. So firming the left leg, inhale, exhale, bring your right leg up onto the inner thigh, and notice what happens here. And they're here in namaste, and whether you hold, you stretch your arms up, that's all secondary. But I want you to notice what's going on in her left foot and ankle. Can you see there's slight wobbling going on? So it's not wrong, but you can see that this is what we call the vrittis, the waves in the mind. Very good, down you go. And the second yoga sutra defines yoga as chitta vritti nirodaha the cessation of the fluctuation of the mind stuff. Or how about this? The intentional stopping of the spontaneous workings of the mind. If it was easy to do, everybody would snap their fingers and they'd be yogis. But it's not easy to do. So if in the hierarchy of purposes, the reason why we're practicing the pose is not just to do free balancing, but to change the wobbling ankle into stability, stand with your back against the pole. And now, same leg, exhale, lift it up. And now just pay attention to her, her standing leg ankle. Do you see how stable it is? So she's calmed the vrittis, the waves in the mind. So if in the hierarchy of why you're doing what pose, you want to be free balancing, the first pose was fine. But if it's trying to align yourself with the yogic definition of chitta vritti, huh? quell those fluctuations in your mind, this is a better pose. Understood? Let's find out, because you're going to do both ways so you can experience it for yourself. Hmm? All right, the onus of responsibility is on the student in yoga. The teacher knows this. I know that sounds a little arrogant, but you get the idea. I'm coming from experience. You have to find out if this is true for you or not. So focusing your gaze straight ahead of you. Your left leg will be the standing leg. The right leg will be the bent leg. Inhale with an exhale, lift your right leg up, put it high into the root of your left thigh. You do the opposite leg, Colleen, so that you're a model for them. The other leg, there you go. And then bring your palms together in Namaste. Slightly resist your bent leg foot into the straight leg thigh and vice versa. John, head up. Remember, back body. Where's the back body awareness? There you go. Keep lifting the chest. Press your thumbs into your sternum and lift up. 
That's right. Now notice what's going on in the standing leg ankle, right? That's the part that we're going to do comparison. All right, see? All right, inhale, exhale, down you go. All right, let's try the other side. Firm in the right leg, inhale, exhale, lift up your left leg. Use your hand to help you, bring it up. Turn the foot on the side of the thigh. Good, one leg might be easier or more difficult than the other. So that's tougher to get you up on that one. Yeah, a little wobbling going on here. Yeah, so we're going to give you an extra tip on this side, you see? But again, you notice how the standing leg is wobbling, right? Inhale, exhale, down you come for a second. So I want to show you two things that are going to help you. First of all, let's get everybody have a chair. This is really good for students that have difficulty bending the knee or have difficulty in hip flexion, all right? So the important thing is what you do is you put your, your foot up onto the chair, like this. See, then this helps you open the hip, but you don't have to worry about the balance so much, all right? So everybody try that. Face straight ahead, chairs to the right of you. Inhale, exhale, lift your leg up. Ah, see, now you have the openness of the, of the leg. And you can use your hand on the inside of your knee. You want to make sure that this, this foot comes a little further forward so the shin is vertical, because we're going to go into another pose that's like that in a moment, like that. Very good. You challenge the knee back with your arm, but you challenge your chest forward. And remember, head back in space, my friend. What'd you learn from the pillar? There you go. Much better. How's that in the groin? OK, good. So this just helps the person open up that area, because the important thing is give the student something to do, even if they don't master the pose. They don't care. As long as I'm working on it, it feels fine. Understood? All right, come down and uh, move the chair to the other side. And let's see you on the second side. See what a difference it makes? Huge. Huge, OK. And again, wasn't, so there's another thing. Not beyond your capacity, just a different mindset. When we say think out of, outside of the box, right? Otherwise, you'd just be struggling. You know, all either you put your foot against the side of your ankle like that, but it's, it's too minimal. You, you're, you're capable of more than that, right? Very good. Chest up, shoulders down. Chest up, shoulders down. Nice. Good. Challenge the knee. OK, on the groin, the side. So that's it, right? Very simple. Now, if you want to add a little extra thing, as you challenge the knee back with your left hand, with your right hand, find your pelvic rim and pull that back in space at the same time. Yes. Now, while you're challenging the knee back, move the hip of your bent leg forward, because you're going to do that in a moment or two in another pose. So you can see how we're sequencing this to move it further and further. Got it? All right. Inhale, exhale, break rank. Now, remember, this, this variation is to teach you the difference between free balancing and noticing the vrittis, the waves in the mind, versus stabilization in the standing leg and what kind of mindset is there. Hmm? Yeah, there you go. See, now when you do that, this shows you how tight the shoulders are. Keep the chin down and the back of the skull up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So normally I would probably put a blanket roll or something so that your head could go back and not be this way. All right, give it a shot. Left leg firm, right leg, inhale, exhale, bend it, bring it up. Good. Use your hand to bring it up any amount if you can. Doesn't matter how high. Good. And then namaste and breathe. So now realize what's going on in the standing leg. And you have a comparison. Contrast and compare. What was going on in the standing leg before, the vritti is being created, and look how stable it is right now. So again, if the hierarchy of purpose, why am I practicing the pose, is to calm the vrittis, you ought to know what's going on in your head right now. Much more stable, much more focused, much less wobbling, not just in the ankle, but in the vrittis. Understood? Take the arms up and even do Urdhva Hastasana and stretch up. Increase the lift of the rib cage off of the spine. Grow the tree. Beaming at that left elbow. All right, exhale, namaste. Very good. Down you go. Take a breath in between. Try the other leg, see how it is. Yeah. Good. Can you reach your left hand underneath the thigh and lift it up a little bit? Yeah, this is where I would use a belt at home. All right, but that's, that's where we are. Now, here's an interesting thing. Have the right hip and buttock back against the wall. That's right. And now, open the left knee without letting the right buttock come forward when you do that. Right? Because as you open the knee, it tends to move the right buttock. Don't. Keep the right buttock back. That's it. And nice soft gaze. Where's that yoga look that everybody wants? Oh, look at that. <laughs> Stretch your arms up and increase the height of your tree limbs. Beautiful. Stretch up. 
ground the toes against the inside of the uh, foot if you can, just like that. And remember, bent leg foot resistant to the straight leg thigh, straight leg thigh resistant to the bent leg foot. But most important is notice the stability in the standing ankle so you realize what it is to calm the vrittis. All right, keep lifting the chest as you exhale, bring it down, namaste. Nicely done. All right, let's move on. Why don't you see the demonstration, then set it up yourself. You're going to step your right leg through for warrior two. All right, so now we're setting up for warrior two. Notice the little difference we've done in this pose by giving yourself an extra support underneath the front leg thigh and to the front arm wrist. Now, checking your arms, there's only one correct position where the arms are level with the shoulders and in line with the shoulders. Not forward, not back, not higher, not lower, but level. Good. Now, fingers are together, thumbs stretched away, active. Look toward the front hand, but pull with the back hand. Very good. Now, when you turn your head to look at the right arm, there's usually a side bend for every rotation. So that means the right side of your neck is usually lower than your left. So lift up the right side of your neck and slightly lower the left side of your neck. Good, and keep that arm up. And challenge your front knee forward and slightly out to the right but stretch your left thigh back like you would in dog pose. Good. Take three long, slow, deep breaths with your face nice and relaxed. Breathe in, breathe out. Good. Second time, breathe in, breathe out. Bring that hand back in space. There you go. And third time, breathe in, breathe out. Very good. Out you go, slowly. Undo the pose and switch to the opposite leg. So all these straight leg, bent leg positions are fine for the knee. Mm -hmm. Good. How is that for the groin for you? All right, so it should be the same understanding on this side, even though very often people are asymmetrical in how they do things. But once again, in line with your shoulders and not higher or lower. So again, more slack has to come out. See, now in line with the shoulders, see? Now, although you're leaning toward your left, don't let your chest turn to the left. Turn your chest back to the right. Yeah, so it's more like Tadasan. So help guide his chest back to the right. Very good. And another thing is, although the awareness seems to be toward the bent leg, notice how I'm giving resistance here. Push your foot into me. Yes, see? Not only from the hip to the outer heel, but from front to back, like dog pose, like that. Exactly. Good. And breathe. Keep bending in the front leg. Good. Fingers together, thumbs stretched apart. Push my foot. See that action? Like that. I'd activate like that. Good. Now remember, you're looking to the left, but you're pulling with the right. And when you turn your head, there's a side bend, so lengthen the left side of your neck, slightly drop the right side of your neck, and take three long, slow, deep breaths. So here's another thing you can do. Hold the hand this way, push into my hand. See, make them stretch the shoulder blade. Just like that. Inhale and exhale. Very simply. Push into my hand. See? So you're stretching that way. And shoulders off your ears. There you go. Pull up on that belt. That's right. Inhale, exhale, down you go. Nicely done. So that's a nice variation for warrior two. All right. One more standing pose, and then we're in the cool down mode. So watch Colleen for this. You open up your belt loop, Parshvakanasan, and you step your legs through it, and you make your loop so that when you bend your right leg into the pose, it goes just below the knee joint, and the rest of the loop catches you right by the back leg, left leg, hip socket. You have to find out the right tension between bending into the front leg and then tightening the loop so that you resist your back leg to the outer heel like you just did in the last pose. Then watch this movement. You start off with the front arm in a fist, and you challenge the hand from the fist to the elbow back. Good. So that's the first one to teach you how to rotate that front knee back. Then, second stage, you drop your hand down to the inside of the front leg. If you can get to the floor, fine. If not, use a block for your hand. But notice how the bottom ribs have come down much more. Now, if you can, and you don't have to, but if you can, take your hand to the back of the leg, classical position, and challenge that knee into the arm and open the chest up. Then comb the hair with the top arm and create that nice diagonal stretch all the way through 
the fingertips on the top arm to the back leg heel. Just like that. Then inhale and come up out of the pose. Nicely done. Change your loop so it goes just below the right knee joint. And you start to bend in. And now you have to check that the front heel is aligned with your back arch. So now put your left hand on your hip. All right. There you go. Keep the buckle off your flesh. Good. Resist the back leg. And then bend the front leg. Good. Now, left hand on your hip. Exhale. Bend the right leg in a fist and put it on the bottom third of your thigh. There you go. And from the fist, pull back toward the elbow on the right arm. See how it challenges your knee back like that? Exactly. Remember that. So that's good. That teaches you the rotation of the front leg. But it doesn't teach you how to get the ribs down. So now, keeping your left hand by your hip, exhale and drop your right hand toward the floor on the inside by the big toe side if you can. Take a couple of breaths. See, your, your rib cage has gotten down. Much better. Keep breathing. If you're having difficulty, you could always use a block. All right. Change nothing else in the pose except move your right hand on the back side of your right leg. Come on. There you go. That's a classical pose. And now your ribs are further down. Turn your chest to the ceiling. There you go. And now combing your hair with your left arm, elongate the whole flank so the fingertips of the top arm and the back leg heel are connected. Now, any amount, rotate. Now, once again, if you stand by their fingers just like this and we say, push into my palm, see, you're stretching. Push into my palm, exactly. Every inhale, you lengthen your arm that way, and then don't forget, push into your back foot, and now rotate your chest to the ceiling, because the bottom ribs are, are short and the top ribs are long. And don't forget to breathe, like that. All right, stamping both feet. Inhale, come up out of the pose. Nicely done. How was that on me? Good. Good. Let's go. Do the other side. You like that variation? It's nice. So much you can do with the belt. Tune in in the future for our Props Are Us version. <laughs> All right. So see whether or not you get the same depth. Maybe you'll understand it a little bit better the second time, right? So first... Front heel back out your line. Use your alignment. There you go. Then bend into your square. As you bend into your front leg, your left leg, resist your back leg. Good. Right hand to your hip socket. Left hand in a fist. Take it on the lower third of the thigh. From the fist side, challenge the elbow back. Yes. And notice how that opens you. Cut your left hip socket forward at the same time. There you go. Head back. Hip forward, head back. There you go. Stage one. All right. Watch how the ribs drop. Stage two, drop the left hand down the inside of your leg, toward the floor. There you go. Any movement is an achievement, with or without the block. Keep challenging the knee back in space. Challenge the left knee back toward the pinky toe side. Head back in space, John. Chest back in space. Yes. Good. Next one, bring it behind the leg. And now challenge the knee into the arm. There you go. From the pubis to the sternum to the collarbones, lift up and stretch to your head. Now. Use the right arm to comb your hair and stretch. Yes, make that long diagonal. It's called Parshva Konasana. It means the flank. So push those fingers. Stretch. Good. And it's a look-up pose. So turn your... There you go. Turn the top chest back and the bottom chest forward. Do not sag the back leg like dog pose. Hit, there you go. Very nice. Use both feet. Stamp the heels. Inhale. Come on up and out. Oh, nicely done. All right, out you go. Very good. The general idea is heat them up, cool them down. Heat them up, cool them down. Now is the cool down pose. And you know, even if the first part of the class is like going through hell, that's the only way you get to heaven. <laughs> it's the Shavasana at the end of the class. I'm so happy. Most people say that's why they do the class, is to do Shavasana at the end. But you don't get the same effect of Shavasana if you didn't do the class first. So have a belt near you. Open up the belt completely and have a block by you. Down. Lie down. At home, you can go up to the highest height, but for today, we're only going to do the second height. Notice how she's put it on her side, and it's across the sacrum. It's across the sacrum, first class. And then she'll roll her shoulders under and lift that chest up. So this is the partial inversion we were talking about. The head is lower than the heart. And then in a moment, we'll get the legs above. So now she's going to stretch her legs forward, elongating the heel, flexing the toe, pressing the legs down. This is stage one. Then to make it a little bit more challenging and to add the inversion with the leg, she's going to bend her right leg at the knee without losing the left leg 
and she's going to lasso the foot and slide her hands down the belt to the best of her ability to get the elbows down on the floor so that the chest stays open and she's not shrugging her shoulders when she's reaching up for the belt. And then she presses the arms to the floor, lifts the chest up, keeps active in the left leg, and then on the raised leg, she tries to pull the shin toward her, but stretch the thigh away from her at the same time. There we go. And then we'll do both sides, and then we'll show you how to set up for Shavasana. Good work. Let's do it, everybody. Lie down on your back. Then bend the legs at the knees, feet flat on the floor. Exhale, lift your hips up. Insert the block on its second height. It's no higher than your waistline. No, no, lie down first, John. Lift up the hips first, then put the block in. That's it. It's no higher than your waistline. Colleen, she can come back and touch it to make sure it's not higher than their waistline. There you go. Feel that first position. And then roll the biceps to the outside. Spin the palms open. Tuck the shoulders under. And lift your chest up. There you go. Neutral chin. So tuck a little bit, John, the chin. There you go. Neutral chin. All right? So stay there for a bit. That's the first stage. Use your breathing. Very safe inversion because the head and the shoulders are down. So this is a way to graduate your understanding to eventually be doing headstand, shoulder stand, handstand, and so forth, which have more challenge to it, but also potentially more fear. So this really creates a sense of groundedness and stability for new students. All right? Now, inhale, exhale from here. Elongate your legs away from your trunk with the heels moving away from you and the toes flexing toward you. Good. Now, if you can bring your legs closer together, compact the legs toward the midline, all the better. If it's hard for you to do that, well, in time it'll be easier for you to do that. All right, and press those legs down. So it's kind of like Tadasan. Grip the ankles in, grip the knees in, grip the hips in. Don't forget, activate the legs. Even in poses that seem to be passive, there's something active that you have to do. All right, so breathing, breathing, breathing. Nothing good is gained by holding your breath. There's no kumbhakas right now. All right. Have your belt near you. Got it? So now keeping your left leg active, bend the right leg at the knee and bring the foot into yourself. Lasso the foot with your belt. Get it by the ball mount of the feet and then slide your hands down the belt till the elbows are touching the floor. Then straighten the right leg. Both hands hold the two sides of the belt. Open the hands out. Ellen, each hand holds a separate part of the belt. There you go. Then slide the elbows down. Yeah, touching the floor means what? There you go. Now, flex the toe, extend the heel. Good. Keep the left leg active. It tends to lose some of its action. Very good. Keep breathing. You're pulling the shin of the raised leg toward you, but you're pressing the thigh of the raised leg away from you. That's it. So let your leg come a little bit further away from you, John, so you can stretch the hamstring more because you're bending the knee. Now stretch the hamstring more. Yeah, don't worry about bringing it closer. That's better, see? As it releases, if and as it releases, but unless and until it does, don't pull it closer. If you're bending the knee, you're not stretching the hamstring. Got it? All right, inhale, exhale. Bring the leg back, take it out, take a breath, switch legs, keep right on going. All right, immediately contrast and compare. Now, Ellen, look up at your right leg. It's veered off of the midline. Bring it in the midline. Notice how different the two legs are working. Right? One leg may seem much stronger or weaker. So bring the leg closer to the midline. Right? Remember, if you look at them from the head side, you'll also see. Good. And press it. Nice. Like that. Open up the toes of the raised leg. Yes. So pull the shin toward your face, but stretch the thigh away from your face. Good. And don't forget to activate that Leg on the floor. Yes, same thing for you. Now, Ellen, your leg is bent, so move the leg away from you. More, away, right? That's it, you see? Very good. Take three long, slow, deep breaths to finish off the pose. Inhale and exhale. Activate the toes, both feet. Inhale and exhale. Soft gaze toward the ceiling. Don't wait for Shavasana to put your face in Shavasana. Inhale and exhale. Nicely done. Down you go. Bend both legs at the knees, breathe in, breathe out. Lift your hips up, take the block out. Slide down and then bring your knees to your chest and relax for a moment. 
Very good. All right, we're going to finish off the class with a nice variation of Shavasana, the corpse pose. So you guys can roll to the side, take a breath, and come up and watch the setup. You're going to use a bolster for your head and two blocks flat on their lowest edge, side by side, like twin beds, you could say. And then you're going to touch the top of your shoulder blade with your hand so you know which bony prominence we're talking about. And then you lie down so that the edge of that shoulder blade is right where the block meets the, the bolster. So this is going to give a nice lift to the upper chest, which again, if you're collapsing, right, in a bad tadasana, right, with your head lurching forward, you don't have what I call clavicle clarity. The collarbones are smushed, and they're much wider than you would normally think. So notice how she has her head a little higher than her chest, and her chest higher than her stomach, and her stomach higher than her pelvis. So she's actually in a modified backbend, but in a very, very supported way. And now I'll ask you to have your hands equidistant from the sides of your body, let your legs flop to the outside, gently close your eyes, and I'll give you some instructions in Shavasana for a few minutes. All right, so let's set that up. Thanks, Colleen. So two blocks side by side, butt it up against the edge of your bolster. Now at home, if you don't have the blocks, you know, one out of every few classes, I just teach classical Shavasana with nothing underneath yourself, so I wouldn't worry about that. But uh, some, of, some people like having a, a blanket underneath their head. So we're going to give him a blanket for his head for sure. Some people like to have a, another bolster behind their knees. But touch that shoulder blade area. Make sure it's right there. John, you look like you're too high on the bolster. Come, come down toward your legs a bit. There you go. Tuck his shoulder. Make sure you feel the shoulder blade. So the same thing for you. Ellen, take one blanket at the lowest edge and just add it underneath your neck. So you can see these slight changes we're making to make sure that the head is slightly high. You don't want your forehead lower than your chin. So Betty, same thing. We can use another. Colleen's going to bring you a blanket. Yeah. So you see, you'll find out by experiment. Was that too high or, that, or not enough? You'll find out in a second. Bring the shoulder blades down on the, on the, there you go. Much better. And that was good? So ha see that blanket? Give him one more blanket, but instead of folding it in half, 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 half as high. All right, make sure your hands are palms facing up. Spin those biceps to the outside. Tuck the triceps slightly in. And have your hands equidistant from the sides of your body. See, that's better, John. See, now slightly tuck your chin, John. There you go. All right. So keep your chest puffed up. Close your eyes. And now we'll give you a little bit of a Shavasan guidance. If you can relax your face, you can relax your brain. So we're going to do three passes around your face, and that's going to help you go deeper. The first pass is on the front of your face, where your forehead is between your eyebrows and your scalp line. So draw a line across the front and the sides of your face. The second pass is when you would put your sunglasses on. So it's going to cover your eye socket below the top of the eyebrow to the area where the bridge of the nose is and wrap it around the side of your face to where your sunglasses would go into the side of your ear. And then the third pass is below your nose to the jut of your jaw. So just underneath your nose, above the upper lip, to your jaw, but then wrap it around the side of your face till it covers the area where your bottom ear lobe is. That's the first pass. Second pass, go back to the top third of your face. Release across the front of the brow, the side of the brow, but now wrap it around the back of the whole skull. Make a complete circumnabulation around the skull at the top third of your face. Then do the middle third of your face, the ocular area. Take it across to where the sunglasses would go, but now wrap it around the middle third in the back of your skull. And then the final third below the nose to the jawline, cover the lips, go by the side of your face, all the way to the bottom of the earlobe, but now wrap your awareness around the back 
bottom third of your face. Soften your gaze. Make sure you're not squeezing your eye. And now the final pass, once again, top third of the face, front of the brow, sides of the temporal lobe, all the way around the back of the skull, but now do it on the inside of your head. Then the middle third, the ocular area, cover all the way to the side of the ear, middle of the ear, wrap it around the back of your face on the second third of your face, but now do it on the inside of your skull. And on the final pass, the lower third of your face, below your nose, upper lip, to the jut of your jaw, and around the side, to the earlobe, but all the way around the back, bottom third of your head, but do it on the inside of your skull. And so this is where the tape will stop, and you can stay in Shavasana for as long as you would like. Many different models for how long you stay in Shavasana, but one of the classical models is half the amount of time you practice. So this practice was about 45 minutes. If you could stay for 25 minutes, it would be great. But if five minutes is all you can give yourself, then make sure you say some positive affirmation before you come back to your daily life. Like, I'm glad to be alive. I love yoga. That's enough. All right, so break your reverie by taking a deeper inhale and exhale. Notice how already there's a sense of quickening as soon as you control the breath again and flush yourself all the way through the bottom of your feet. Take another breath, coming closer to the surface with zest for life and passion for existence. And with your next exhale, maintain that anchoring in that calm, quiet that you feel inside, which is called shanti in yoga, the peace that you get from practice. And now bend your left leg at the knee, put the foot to the floor, inhale here, exhale, roll to the right, and come into a kind of fetal position on the right side, head down, chin down, heart down. If you want to put your right cheek on your right upper arm for a moment, you can. And then after a breath or two, when you're feeling ready, press your left arm, press the sides of your body, and come sit up. And then just quickly sit into cross-legged posture and come into namaste and give a moment of thankfulness and gratefulness for all the causes and conditions that have brought us here today safely and enabled us to be inspired enough to want to practice yoga. Have a beautiful life. Namaste.